It's great to be here. Um, I think this is my second time, maybe third time. Um, some of you might remember me, some, some of you might be new. Uh, but um, I'm a good friend of Pastor Paul's, and uh, I know that he is uh, laboring in Africa. And um, just when he asked, you know, today is Father's Day, by the way, right? And so when I mentioned to my church that uh, I was going to be away, they weren't very happy. But I said, you know, I got to go help my friend, Pastor Paul. So I'm here. Um, I know a lot of you are young here, but uh, how many of you are fathers here? Can you raise your hand? Can I just see the? All right, we have a few. Happy Father's Day, by the way. All right, happy Father's Day. All right, let's pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you for the amazing God that you are. And Father, we thank you that you have loved us so much that you sent your son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. Father, we come together to worship you. We now we desire to lift up our hearts and open our hearts to listen to your word. Father, change us and mold us and, and, and use us for your kingdom's work. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I would think that most of, you, most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with the story uh, that was read earlier today. It is of a, a woman. Uh, it's, you know, written as a Canaan, Canaanite woman. Uh, the one more thing that we can catch from the text is that she was a mother. And so, and I think that you will see that that becomes very important. And not only was she uh, a woman uh, that was really a sort of outcast uh, from the Jewish perspective because she was a Canaanite woman, you know, meaning essentially there were mixed bloods. Um, and the, the Jewish people at the time, the Israel, um, did not like anything that was mixed, uh, whether racially or otherwise. And, and she was not treated very well, as you can tell from the story. Uh, and, and I think you would immediately understand what I'm talking about. As soon as you put yourself where she was in the story, you begin to realize how mistreated she was, right? But then the conclusion of the story is that she got what she wished, right? And, and she also received an amazing consolation uh, from Jesus, and uh, we're going to talk about that, and that is faith. And I know that we often um, talk about faith because faith is so central to who we are, and it is all important uh, in God's kingdom, and it is by faith that we, we live, it is by faith that we are saved, and it is by faith that we please God, and so on and so forth. Um, so we want to talk a little bit more about faith today, and even though this is a Father's Day, I felt that even though I don't, I'm not speaking directly on the topic of father, I think it'd be appropriate for us to talk about faith at any time. So, what I wanted to do was this. First, define what a true faith is. And this definition is limited only because it comes directly out of the text. Only the text. And I'm not drawing from any other part of the scripture. Um, and so th this is a three-prong definition of what a true faith is. So I'm going to define it for you before I uh, speak more about the definition as I go along. First, a true faith is not losing the sight of the Lord. And I think if you think about it, you understand what I'm talking about. So that's the first part. So you say, I have faith. But if you do not have in your sight Jesus Christ, then where is your faith, right? The second prong of this definition is this. Even though, even though we, we say we have faith, if we don't pursue Jesus, not only do we need to have Jesus Christ in our sight, you know, we often have, you know, set our sights on something, but how many of us actually really pursue it? And so faith requires us not only to set our sight on Jesus Christ, 
but also to pursue what we set uh, in our, at our sight. So, uh, not losing the sight of the Lord, but relentlessly pursuing Jesus. That would be the second prong of the definition of what a true um, faith is. And I think you'll see why that is part of the definition from the text. And thirdly, in the face of discouragement. You know, um, faith is easy when things go well, right? You say, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, and thank you, Lord. I am just perfectly satisfied, thank you, Lord. But when things go bad, when you run into disappointments, discouragement, that's when your faith is really tested. And so I think that you will see these three prongs, three elements of faith from the text today, and I want to go over each one with you. So first, I wanted to give you the picture of what's going on here. And there's Jesus, and there were the disciples, and there was this woman, a Canaanite woman, a mother. What did she say? Lord, help me. Why? Because my daughter is severely demon-possessed. And she is literally kneeling down before Jesus Christ. And at the end, what did Jesus say? Woman, you have great faith. Wouldn't it be wonderful for each and every one of us to hear those words from our Lord Jesus Christ? You have great faith. What an amazing thing it would be to hear that, right? The reality is you can and you will. We just need to focus on what it is that allowed Jesus to respond to with those words. And we can learn from this woman, the Canaanite woman. And here's one thing that I wanted to point out before I go on. She was a mother. If you know anything about mothers, sometimes, you know, I, as I think of my mother, who's passed away about a couple of years ago, she lived to, to be about 100 years old. And, she, you know, we lived together you know, together all of my life, and uh, uh, I look back and and I say, hmm, mothers are sometimes impossible. You cannot explain mothers sometimes. The intensity of the care, intensity of love that they exhibit sometimes. Sometimes it's overwhelming. I know, you know, I know that many of you understand what I'm talking about. It's just sometimes very so intense. They're willing to do anything. And that's the picture that you're seeing right now. A mother, a desperate mother, will do anything for her daughter. So let's go over these three points. First, this Canaanite woman slash mother Never lost the sight of the Lord. What does that mean? Never lost the sight of the Lord. Do you ever lose the sight of the Lord? Or do you even have the sight of the Lord in your life? When you live through life, on, even on a daily basis, where do you set your sight? Of? Where is your sight set on? Ask yourself. See if you can answer that question. Or do you really have anything to set your sight on. But the reality is this woman set her sight on the Lord. Let's talk about this woman a little bit. The incredible thing about this woman is this, that she knew, she knew the identity, exact identity of Jesus Christ. We sometimes think that we have faith and we don't even know who Jesus Christ is. We know the name. We know that he appears in the Bible. We know that he appeared in history. We know that he came 
as a man. We know that he ministered as, you know, and on this earth, and he died on the cross, he rose again, he ascended to heaven, and he promised to come back. We know these storylines. But do you really know who this Jesus is? But this woman did. This woman knew the identity, exact identity of Jesus Christ. How do I know this from the text? Because she, in the text, three times referred to Jesus Christ as the Lord. And one time, very specifically said, Lord, Son of David. This is very significant. Lord, Son of David. It is, it's a designation that is not given to anyone or everybody. It is given to a very specific person. The, there can only be one person that can qualify for this designation. Lord, Son of David. That's Jesus Christ. And she knew it. She knew that she was kneeling before the Lord, the Lord, the Son of David. So we come to worship. And do we know who we are worshiping this afternoon? Who do you have in mind in terms of your worship? Who are you thinking in terms of your worship? Who are you before at this moment? You see, there was something very special about this woman. She knew the exact identity of Jesus Christ. And your faith cannot be real unless you know the identity of Jesus Christ. Not only that, the Bible says even the devil knows who Jesus Christ is. Some people that are not believers may know who Jesus Christ is. But this woman distinguished herself by not only knowing the identity of Jesus Christ, but she acknowledged the lordship of Jesus Christ over her and over her daughter and over the daughter's sick condition. See, that's what faith is. What faith allows us to do is to know Jesus Christ exactly who Jesus Christ is. And to be able to acknowledge his lordship over our lives, every aspect, every aspect of our lives. That's what real faith is. And this woman had it. And then the second prong is that this Canaanite woman or mother never stop pursuing the Lord. You see, that's what faith does. You say, I have faith, and you say, well, you know what? I tried it. I tried it. But I'm going to quit here. You know what that means? That means you never had faith. The faith will not allow you to stop. This woman had great faith, and her faith was different because she never stopped pursuing Jesus Christ. So let's look at her again. She applied and acted upon her knowledge of Jesus Christ. We, how often we say to God, I, you know, we, sometimes we come to God and we pray, but do we really trust that God is listening and God will grant us our prayers? We sometimes pursue God, but we get tired. We don't act upon our faith. You know, um, acting upon faith is something like this. You've probably heard of this, but I think this is as good of an illustration as anybody could give. So your, your car is parked here on the side street somewhere, and that's where I parked, next to the church. You know, I, I drove, and I was a little bit early, so there were some rooms there, and uh, guess what I did? 
I saw the trees and I saw the shades. I said, you know what? Let me take that shaded area before anybody else get it. And so I parked my car there. So at the end of t today's worship, you know, I need to drive back to Pennsylvania. And so I get into my car and I turn the engine on. Hopefully it'll turn on. And I just sit there. I just sit there. And I just sit there. And my heart says, I, I want to go to Pennsylvania. I want to go home. But I just sit there. If I desire it, will the car ever move? No. The only way the car will move is if I, you know, change the gear and I put some gas and I turn my wheels and I continue to control the car that way. That is, unless you act upon your desire, you will never be able to know whether you have faith. You see, that's what this woman did. This woman just simply sat, you know, sit there and said, you know, somehow Jesus will heal my daughter. She didn't do that. She acted upon her faith. Her faith told her that Jesus was God, the creator. She knew the identity of the Messiah. And she acknowledged that Jesus had the lordship over her life, even over the sickness of her daughter. And not only that, she's decided to act on it. She would come. She would beg. She would ask. She would follow. She would do whatever it takes. How often do we not do that? How often do we simply say, I have faith, but not move on that faith? Here's another really interesting thing that she knew. She knew that the help could only come from the Lord. Now, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Psalm 121. But it says, Psalm 121, verse 1 and 2. I lift up my eyes to the hills. And you guys know the rest. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. You see... She has an ailment that only one person could heal. That is God himself. And she knew. She knew that it, the help can only come from the Lord. You see, this is why she never stopped pursuing Jesus Christ. Do you know that? Or did you know that? Did you know that the help that you need can only come from God, the maker of heaven and earth? Did you know that? Sometimes you might think the help comes from somebody next to you or somebody in the family, somebody around you. Sometimes you might think it's circumstantial. But according to the scripture, the help can only come from the maker of heaven and earth, from God. So she knew that. Does your faith tell you that? When you're in trouble, what do you do? I mean, do you really believe the Bible? The one thing about the Bible, you know, I'll just give you a little uh, insight to my heart. The thing about the Bible is this. You know, as, having practiced law for about 35 years, 
I realize how terrible the system of evidence is. And in this country, we're supposed to have the best legal system in the world. And I've used it, I've depended on it, I've studied it, and come, came to one conclusion. The, all the rules of evidence are really, really saddled with problems. That's why you see a lot of you know, prisoners who, are, who have to be freed now because they were improperly convicted. You know, with their you know, new DNA testing, they realized that we had the wrong person in jail after 20 years, 25 years. And, and the reality is approximately 20% to 25% of the cases may be off. That's the kind of the system we have in terms of getting at the truth. So once I experience that and I look at the scripture, it's an amazing, amazing book. There's nothing in this book that misses the mark. Over the thousands of years, how many critics we, have we had? How many people that are trying to tear the Bible apart? No, no book, no theory, no, no, nothing, no principles. There's nothing that would come even close that has been attacked as much as the Bible. The Bible has withstand, withstood the test of times. So I ask you, because I believe with all my heart, the Bible is the Word of God. I do. Do you believe the Bible to be the Word of God? If you do, it's your faith that's telling you that. And if it's that faith, then you will understand exactly what this woman is going through. Because in light of the presence of the Lord. There wasn't anything that she would not have done. And if you recognize that the Bible is the Word of God, you recognize that you have faith, that you would not hesitate to do anything and everything before the Lord. And that is the picture that you see in the today's text. So the third prong is this. This faith has to be tested under the most egregious and most difficult circumstances. And this woman did not allow her disappointments to wash away her faith. A little bit more about her. The one thing that we do know is that she was humble. She was humble. How would you like to be treated, not treated, but be called as dog? You know, I know that I hear this. Oftentimes, we, we talk about discrimination uh, and sometimes we talk about people that are looking at you funny, talking to you a little funny, looking down upon you. How would you like to be called as a dog? Directly. No innuendos, no Im implying of anything. There's, you're a dog. You see, she could have given up very easily, and her giving up would have been justified. Think about it. Why would I want to go before the person that's calling me a dog and beg for things? 
If you explain that, you know, that someone who is listening to you might be saying, yeah, you were fully justified in not following that person. Yeah, I think you did the right thing. But where does that get you? See, this woman was different. Despite all this, she did not display an ounce of her self-righteousness. That's faith. That's faith. Another thing that we know is that she was, she knew, and she was utterly dependent upon Jesus Christ. She knew she had no other choice. She knew that this is the only opportunity she had to save her daughter. Did you know that it's Jesus Christ is the only opportunity that you and I have to gain salvation? Only opportunity. She knew that. That's faith. And another thing that that we can observe from the text. It's not as readily visible, but it's hidden in the, stru- in, the, in the text that she was in a worship mode. She was in worship. Not only was she, in terms of her posture, kneeling down before the Lord, but she was literally worshiping Him. Lord, It doesn't matter what you do to me. I still worship you because you are God and I don't care if I'm a dog. You can grant my desires and I worship you. See, the reality is you and I are not much better that hurt. We are all in need of a Savior. We are sinners. Where can sinners go? Just because we don't see the sin in each other all the time? Just because our world has literally dimmed our vision? in terms of seeing what's immoral, what's sinful, it doesn't mean that we're not sinners before the Lord. And God sees every one of us exactly the way we are as sinners. And in that sense, we're really no better than the Canaanite woman. But we need to have in our hearts a desperate need, a desperate need of a mother a desperate need to be forgiven of our sins, and understanding that there's nobody else, there's no one else who is able to save us other than Jesus Christ himself. Crying out. See, that's faith. I say that she was in worship mode because she focused solely on pleasing God. Pleasing God. Not herself. How many of us are into pleasing ourselves? The whole world is, the Hollywood, the the whole world is gone mad in trying to please themselves, whether it's music, whether it's drug, whether it's sex, whether it's whatever it is, they are just doing all of it just to please themselves. But this woman was different. She was focused on pleasing the Lord, and she succeeded. What efforts are you making today trying to please God? Because without faith, 
we cannot please God. Without faith, we cannot please God. And here's a neat thing about it. You know, we're here to, to worship today, right? Corporate worship, which is really, really important. And it's commanded, and it's something we ought to do. But do you know that you can be sitting here and not be worshiping God? Because the true worship is when you act upon your true faith. Each and every time you act out of, upon your faith, you enter into worship of God. And that is a real challenge for all of us, isn't it? Because we tend to blame other people. Why I couldn't do this? Why I can't succeed? Why I can't? You know, there's so many reasons. And a true faith also does not buckle under pressure. Pressure. She was under a lot of pressure. She didn't buckle. I know that many of you may be going through hardships, sufferings, or you may not even realize what's ahead in life. But if you have faith, a true faith, and you will relentlessly pursue Jesus Christ, and you acknowledge the lordship of Jesus Christ over your life, over all the little details of your life, then you will succeed. It's not my promise. It's the promise to the Word of God. So let's go over it one more time. What's true faith? True faith is not losing the sight of the Lord and relentlessly pursuing Jesus Christ in the face of significant, overwhelming disappointments in life. That's the story that was read to you. And so I challenge you this afternoon. Will you be men, men and women of faith? Or will you just continue to live your life and allow whatever may come just to hit you left and right? Or will you set your sight on Jesus Christ and never lose the sight so that you don't go to the left or to the right. Even under the most severe circumstances. If you do, Jesus will call you and say, you have great faith. My son, my daughter, you have great faith. And I will give you the desires of your heart. And before you can say amen, your desires will have been granted. You see, we're serving an amazing God. A God who not only listens, but God who has prepared for us all these treasures. And it takes the key to unlock that treasure trove. And that key is faith, of true faith. And I hope and pray that you'll be able to meditate upon this passage this week and really learn from her what it means to really worship God. Let's pray.